Good evening, everyone. And welcome to our first presentation in the Embracing God's Creation series, entitled A Trinitarian Spirituality of Attentiveness. I'm Sister Whitney Shields. I'm a member of Bellarmine Chapel and a part of the planning team for this series. And tonight I'll be acting as your MC. We thought it would be appropriate to begin with Pope Francis's A Prayer for Our Earth, found at the end of his 2015 encyclical, Laudato Si, on care for our common home. All-powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. O God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives that we may protect the world and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to deliver the worth, teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey toward your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. Amen. So before I introduce our speaker for the night, let me just give you a little background on the Embracing God's Creation series. This series is a collaborative effort of the Cincinnati Jesuit family that includes Bellarmine Parish, Bellarmine Chapel, St. Xavier Parish, Xavier University's Institute for Spirituality and Social Justice, St. Xavier High School, the Jesuit Spiritual Center at Milford, and the newly formed Xavier Jesuit Academy. The series is grounded in both Pope Francis's encyclical, Laudato Si, on care for our common home, and on the Global Society of Jesus' 2019 Universal Apostolic Preference Number 4, Caring for Our Common Home, which establishes this as a priority for all Jesuit works over the next decade. The hope is that by exploring the ecological spirituality of Laudato Si together as a Jesuit family, we can foster not only individual and institutional transformation, but wider transformation in our church. As you listen today, we invite you to experience an ecological conversion, an awakening to the many ways God is active in our world, caring for creation and loving each of us as part of creation. The series itself will involve presentations like this one, family-friendly immersions, and prayer experiences. We hope that this variety of offerings will invite each member of our communities to engage some part of the series over the next year. Thank you all for being with us today. So our format for tonight is simple. I'll introduce our speaker who will share with us for the next 45 minutes or so. Then we'll break into discussion pods to reflect on how what we've just heard impacts us. Reflection questions are on the handout you received as you entered. Finally, we'll return to the large group for some sharing and Q&A. For those who are watching the live stream and previously RSVP'd, you should have received a Zoom link via email when we go into discussion pods, we invite you to log into the Zoom link for your small group discussion. If you didn't receive the link, it's available beneath the YouTube video in the live stream description. The slides for tonight are also there in case you have trouble seeing them on your screen. With that, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Vincent Miller, professor at the University of Dayton, Dr. Miller serves as the university's first Gudorf Chair in Catholic Theology and Culture and the Committee Chair of Doctoral Programs in Theology. Dr. Miller earned his PhD at Notre Dame and came to the University of Dayton from Georgetown University, where he taught for more than a decade. He's the author of many articles and books connected to the intersection of care for creation and Christ Christian theology, including the 2017 edited work the Theological and Ecological Vision of Laudato Si, Everything is Connected. Welcome, Dr. Miller.
thank you so much, Whitney. Uh, am I on? Uh, thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, thank you to all of you out there in Zoom land as well. It's humbling to be uh, part of this organization, uh, this, this group that's working together across all these Ignatian groups in Cincinnati. Okay, here, I will speak louder. How's that? It's picking up now. Okay, I will raise my mic too. There we go. Um, so it's great to be here, um, and it just seems like a wonderful uh, program and initiative you put together as a way of addressing the Laudato Si action platform and the Laudato Si goals. Uh, I was asked to do something on spirituality and Laudato Si. Uh, how's that level going? It's, it seems quite loud to me, but okay. I don't like to hear my voice. Uh, so uh, what I've proposed is to talk about a Trinitarian spirituality of attentiveness, uh, and I put those other words on there to give a context for it and to make it a very long uh, title, probably too long. We exist within the midst of a collective moral and spiritual crisis, and I want to emphasize the collective nature of that. I'm not particularly interested in talking about um, our individual responsibility for these problems because the problems are so very much shared. Uh, so there's all sorts of things we can do to form ourselves to respond, to take them seriously, but the response really needs to be collective. Um, we live in a moment of profound and collectively unrecognized crisis. We, you know, we've put as much CO2 in the atmosphere uh, we've put basically one ice age worth of CO2 in the atmosphere. The difference between the ice age being frozen and the interglacial period, right? That much CO2, we've added that much more. Uh, we've currently warmed uh, the Earth's temperature two degrees Fahrenheit, and that much CO2 is certainly going to warm it quite a bit more once we reach equilibrium. Of course, we are putting more and more CO2 in the atmosphere every second. Uh, for the past three years and more, we've witnessed unfolding crises, right? Wildfires uh, on all the continents, wildfires in the Arctic Circle, uh, droughts in the Southwest. Uh, in the past year alone, we've had crop failures in the United States and Canada, wheat crop failures. Uh, we have wheat crop failures and rice failures in Italy and Europe. Uh, this spring in the Punjab and uh, India, their bread basket, the temperatures got so high in the last month of the wheat, wheat crop, uh, the time when the wheat is swelling and putting on its final weight, that that couldn't happen. There was a, there was a failure of crops there. There's been a, an enormous, unprecedented heat wave in China over, the, over this summer. And again, there's crop failures there as a result of that. All of this should be a big deal. If you're watching the wheat futures chart, you'll see that it is a big deal. Uh, India announced that it's not going to be exporting any grain this year. That's a big deal on the markets. But these things are not really breaking through into our collective consciousness. One of the things that I find really worth meditating on this moment is Pakistan. Right, so the, the incredibly intense monsoon rains that came this year, uh, 33 million people have been flooded out of their homes, or homeless now, 33 million. That is Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Michigan put together. 33 million people who can't return home, and the crop in that nation has failed for the year. So it's 33 million, there's a lot more people who live in Pakistan, and there's no food for them. The crisis is here, right? But it's not in the headlines. It's not something that we share uh, in, in sort of common discourse. And so the crisis is this collective disconnect. We're individually connected, but collectively disconnected. Uh, and so I think there are three dimensions to this spiritual crisis we can list. There's others. Um, the inability to recognize the destruction and suffering that's already happening, right? We don't realize how very late it already is. Um, the collective inability to appreciate the consequences of our civilization's actions. We really don't know where we live and what that does. And the inability to take responsible action to change for the good of current and future generations. That is a political failure, right? The, the failure to, to organize. Uh, these are things that, this is the world we live in. This is the disconnect, the disjuncture we live in. Um, and again, I'm not particularly interested in forcing this on the individual level, right? You would not be here tonight if you didn't care about these things. Um, the question is, how do we bring this into consciousness? Uh, I want to talk about Laudato Si in that regard. Um, 
uh, Laudato Si as a moral and spiritual vision. And it's more than a statement of moral obligation. That's the key thing I want to get across. I want to stress, I think it's so important for understanding what the document does. Um, it's a spiritual, it offers a spiritual vision of human life and its place in creation that's grounded in a Trinitarian spirituality of communion. Its central concept, integral ecology, is a way of seeing. That's really what I think is valuable about this encyclical. It's a way of seeing and valuing relationships. And as I say up here, there are, there are three dimensions to it that I'll talk about uh, in the course of tonight. Uh, the first is, the first dimension of integral ecology is the belief that creation reflects the triune nature of God. That we, we believe that creation is constituted in relationships. That's constituted in connection. Um, flowing from that um, is a uh, particular way of seeing that's attentive to interconnection, that's attentive to relationship. So we believe that the world is constituted in relationships, and that leads to a particular way of seeing the world that's attentive, that's, in, that's interested in what those relationships are, whether those are social, political, cultural, or ecological. And finally, there's a moral principle that values those relationships, that says the web of life is valuable as a web, and we are a part of it, and the, we need to honor, revere, uh, cherish, and restore those relationships. So that's the moral payoff, but it comes after the awareness of their existence. And uh, in the course of my conversation, I will go back and forth between Laudato Si and Francis' other uses of the word gaze. Uh, so this way of seeing is going to be central. So uh, we spoke in the introduction about Laudato Si as an ecological conversion. Uh, and I just want to point out here that how its description of ecological conversion is that it entails a loving awareness that we are not disconnected from the rest of creatures, but joined in a splendid universal communion. As believers, we do not look at the world from without, but from within, conscious of the bonds with which the Father has linked us to all beings. Ecological conversion here is talked, about, is talked about in terms of awareness, of seeing our relationships, of imagining ourselves in relationships. It doesn't primarily begin with action, right? Go do something, be convicted. It's not an act of will. It's an act of opening our eyes and seeing how we are part of a broader web. We are part of creation. One of the most powerful lines from the encyclical that's quoted by many, many people and stood out to many of us as we read it on the first day that it came out, um, again, links awareness and transformation. Our goal, Francis is saying about what he's doing here, is not to amass information to satisfy curiosity, but rather to become painfully aware, to dare to turn what is happening into the world into our own personal suffering, and thus to discover what each of us can do about it. So awareness is central to how this encyclical works. I'd like to link this up with the Laudato Si action platform and just point out how some of the Laudato Si goals are particularly relevant here. Uh, the two central ones, which come directly from the encyclical, from Laudato Si, the res response to the cry of the earth and response to the cry of the poor. Uh, the other ones that are particularly relevant are ecological education. Uh, learning and sharing and, and forming uh, forming the young and forming the old in awareness of the interconnections that are around us that sustain us ecologically in the world. And finally, ecological spirituality. Uh, ecological spirituality, the, the spirituality I'm going to be offering here is this spirituality of attentiveness, of open eyes. All right. So let's get to the Trinitarian dimension of Laudato Si. Uh, so a Trinitarian spirituality relationship. This comes in paragraph 240, and I think it's really the heart of the whole encyclical. Uh, as Francis says, the divine persons are subsistent relations, and the world created according to the divine model is a web of relationships. Creatures tend towards God, and in turn it is proper that every living being tends toward other things, so that through the universe we can find any number of constant and secretly interwoven relationships. This is that first level of integral ecology that I want to stress here, is that a belief in the Trinity, a belief that the creator of the world is already constituted in relationships, and the world therefore reflects God's relational character. 
So before we see anything, before we do anything, there is in Christianity, in the heart of Catholicism, this belief that the world will be constituted in relationships. We're prepared, we're primed to be receptive to the kinds of lessons that ecology teaches us. Francis goes on to connect our own flourishing with that view of the world. Uh, the human person grows more, matures more, and is sanctified more to the extent that he or she enters into relationships, going out from themselves to live in communion with God, with others, and with all creatures. In this way, they make their own that Trinitarian dynamism which God imprinted in them when they were created. So you can think about the sixth day of creation in the book of Genesis here. Uh, as you know, there's the refrain uh, in creation. After every day of creation, uh, Genesis has, and God saw that it was good. On the sixth day, um, often misunderstood as human beings being the climax of the sixth day, on the sixth day after humans are created, God stands back and looks at all that God had made. All that God had made and says, and saw that it was very good. The rhyme structure is change for the sixth day to stress the creation together in its full harmony, in its full flourishing together, is better than any part alone. Creation is made to be a harmony of all its parts. And here, Francis is pointing out that we find our fulfillment in being part of that harmony and in going out into relationship with other humans and the rest of creation. Finally, this leads to a particular way of acting, which is to value relationships. Everything is interconnected, and this invites us to develop a spirituality of that global solidarity which flows from the mystery of the Trinity. Solidarity here as actively honoring our interconnectedness. This echoes, I think, very much uh, a line from Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. This was profoundly true about the United States uh, in the Jim Crow era, right? The violence against African Americans in this country was violence against all. Uh, it destroyed all of us. It, poisoned everyone's heart and was violent, uh, violent visitation against uh, legally, legal violence against African Americans. Um, if that was true then, it's especially true now as well, um, that we are all interconnected socially. Injustices uh, poison the whole body politic. Uh, but also, we're increasingly aware about how ecological injustices uh, are a threat to us as well. Unless the world flourishes around us, we will not flourish. As I just described the current effects of, 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 of global climate change, right? I described breadbasket failures around the world. It's our problem. It's not just about the planet. It's us. Francis says a lot about interrelationship and relational character of creation. Uh, and he links it repeatedly to uh, the mystery of God. The universe as a whole in all its manifold relationships shows forth the inexhaustible riches of God. Aquinas noted that the multiplicity and variety come from the intention of the first agent who willed that what was wanting in one in the representation of the divine goodness might be supplied by another inasmuch as God's goodness could not be represented by any one creature. Uh, here saying that every creature made shows some aspect of the divine goodness. And without the whole harmony of creation, we can't fully understand God. Every creature, every species. Uh, we live in a time when uh, the extinction rate is somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times higher than the background rate, heading into a, a, a sixth great extinction. And each one of those creatures, right, is singing part of the harmony of creation. Their voice is necessary for us to understand the fullness of God. So to begin to talk about seeing things, 
Francis says we need to grasp the variety of things and their multiple relationships, attend to their relationships. We understand better the importance and meaning of each creature if we contemplate it within the entirety of God's plan. The Catechism teaches God wills the interdependence of creatures. The sun and the moon, the cedar and the little flower, the eagle and the sparrow, the spectacle of their countless diversities and inequalities tells us that no creature is self-deficient. Creatures exist only in dependence on one another, to complete one another, in the service of each other. Okay, so I'm giving you a lot of quotes from the encyclical that makes this connection between God's triune nature and the relational character of creation. So it's one thing to say that we believe this, right? Uh, it's one thing to say that we're all for this, and it's another thing to actually attend to it. It's one thing to say in the abstract that, you know, the world is a beautiful harmony, but then what is my part in it? Do I hear the other voices around me? Do I partner with the rest of creation around me? Am I attentive to it? So how do we see and experience those connections in reality? An interesting line comes up later in the encyclical. He's quoting St. Bonaventure. Uh, teaches us that each creature bears in itself a specifically Trinitarian structure so real that it could be readily contemplated if only the human gaze were not so partial, dark, and fragile. So there's a weakness in our gaze, a failure in our ability to see. I'd like to switch gears from the encyclical and turn to a piece of art and begin to talk about the Trinity and the gaze. Many of you probably know this. This is Andrei Rublev's uh, The Trinity, The Angels at Memory. Uh, one of the most famous Russian icons of the Trinity there is. Uh, it's a small screen, perhaps you've seen it before. Let me zoom in a bit. What do you see? One tree? Yeah. Not a very big oak, but it's there, yeah. Interesting, the, the primary colors from nature, the, the pigments are, are natural. Very much so, yeah. It looks like they're talking to each other, right? It looks there's, 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 it conveys engagement in some way. I'll read you a, a brief passage from Henry Nouwen about this icon. Uh, he says, as we place ourselves in front of the icon in prayer, we come to experience a gentle invitation to participate in the intimate conversation that is taking place among the three divine angels. Of course, there's no conversation to be heard here. How do we know that there's a conversation going on there? What, what's, the, what's the intensity that this represents? They're gazing, at each other. They're gazing at each other, right? That gaze is so powerful here. We're drawn into that, right? The intensity of how they're looking towards each other. And that evokes the relationship in a powerful way. There's, there, there's a deep, quiet communion to this image. It's, it's the root of why it is such a famous image. Uh, you're drawn into it in some way. And it's, it's, it, it is the sincerity of the gaze that's a big part of that. We're drawn into their mutual regard. There's something powerful about the gaze, even though it doesn't engage the viewer, right? There are other icons that are looking right at you, right? Christ the Pantocrator, or images of the Madonna looking at you. So uh, Our Lady of the Madonna of Vladimir uh, is staring right at you, and you're drawn into that relationship. Here, they're not looking at us. Their deep engagement with each other provides a powerful symbol of the Trinitarian relationships. The completeness of their attention and response to one another is striking. There's no distraction. There's a totality of relationship portrayed in their gaze. It's worth thinking a little bit about why this works so well as an icon of the Trinity. For human beings, uh, the gaze is very powerful. We're a social species. Uh, one of the things I'm told, right, is not all mammals have whites in their eyes. Uh, we know when we're looking at each other. We know when, you know, when we're giving side eye. You can't give side eye if you don't have whites to your eyes, right? Uh, we know what we're looking at. 
we can desire what we each desire, right? We see that someone noticed there's an apple tree over there and we all notice that, right? Or there's something interesting. Uh, we know what we're looking at. We communicate with our gaze. The gaze is a powerful social reality for us. The gaze is profoundly important to Pope Francis as well. Uh, you may remember that interview he gave in American Magazine at the very beginning of his papacy, which landed a, as a bit of a thunderbolt. Uh, recent popes, no pope, generally talked like that. Uh, he was asked to describe himself, and he paused, and he said, I'm a sinner who the Lord has looked upon. I am one who is looked upon by the Lord. I always felt my motto, miserando atque eligendo, by having mercy and choosing him, was very true for me. The motto is taken from the homilies of St. Bede the Venerable, uh, and it's, it's about the conversion of Matthew. He says, Jesus saw a publican, a uh, tax collector, since he looked at him, and since he looked at him with feelings of love and chose him, that's the miserando equi eligendo, uh, he said to him, follow me. The Pope then goes on to add, I think the Latin gerund miserando is impossible to translate in both Italian and Spanish. I like to try to translate it with another gerund that does not exist. Misericordiando, uh, mercying. He sees Jesus' gaze here as mercying. The gaze itself brings mercy. The gaze itself creates love. And he talks about this image from Caravaggio, the calling of St. Matthew. He said, that's me, I feel like him. And the interviewer says, here the Pope became determined, as if he had finally found the image he was looking for. It's the gesture of Matthew that strikes me. He holds onto his money as if to say, not me, no, the money is mine. Uh, I'm not sure I totally agree with Francis's reading of this image. He finds things in it that are important. Um, what I find striking about this image, uh, there we go. Uh, so you have, this, this is pedantic, but I'll point it, you know, this is Jesus here, uh, and he's pointing, and there's this man right here uh, who's not holding on to his money, um, and he's going like this, you know, him, me, which? Uh, so there's this indecision there, right? He's not quite sure he wants to be the one called, the gestures, right? Christ's gesture is quite clear. You may remember that gesture. That's also from uh, the creation of Adam uh, in the Sistine Chapel. Christ's hand. Christ is very clear. You. His, and Christ's gaze is fixed upon him. Caravaggio does this wonderful thing. There's the indecision in the hand. He's like, mm, him? But their gazes are locked. Matthew is looking clearly right back at him. He knows that he's being addressed. Right. There is no doubt in the gaze, even though he's trying to weasel out of it with his hand. Perhaps you mean this other guy. Um, very curious, you'll notice that there he's doing something weird with light. He often conveys grace with light. Chiaroscuro, light and dark. Uh, the line of light is coming down here, uh, and it would go through there. Uh, there's clearly a shadow that's supposed to go through there, but his face is completely illuminated. Jesus' gaze is the source of that light, right? So here's mercying the gaze as a positive thing. Francis, Pope Francis talks about this gaze uh, in a very powerful passage from Laudato Si. He speaks of a gaze of serene attentiveness. We are speaking of an attitude of the heart, one which approaches life with serene attentiveness, which is capable of being fully present to someone without thinking of what comes next, which accepts each moment as a gift from God to be lived to the full. Jesus taught us this attitude when he invited us to contemplate the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. Or when seeing the rich young man and knowing his restlessness, he looked at him with love, brings in his passage. He was completely present to everyone and everything. And in this way, he showed us the way to overcome that unhealthy anxiety which makes us superficial, aggressive, and compulsive consumers. 
I work on occasion um, with scientists at an experimental forest in Oregon. Uh, Oregon is deep in what used to be called the nun zone. It's very low religious participation rates out there. There is actually a Dominican uh, friary on the same road. Uh, they don't really know each other very well. Um, the scientists there are, are, are not particularly uh, uh, conventionally religious. And I shared an essay on the Dotto Sea with, with a geologist there because he wanted to read what I did. And he came back and he said, I want to have a gaze of serene attentiveness. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. Right? I want to honor what's going on in the world and understand its complexities. That phrase, he just picked that phrase out of, out of the encyclical. And he said, that's exactly it. That's what I'm trying to do. Here's another image with another gaze. This is John August Swanson, uh, the wonderful uh, North American uh, serigraph artist uh, who just passed in the past year, a beautiful person. Uh, this is Francis and the Wolf. What do you see here in this image? Okay, so there's predators and prey and there's harmony all around? Absolutely, yeah. St. Francis, Francis is praying, indeed. Very much so. Uh, I wish it was bigger. Um, I own a copy of this, I should have brought it and we could have, could have handed it around. Um, it's hard to convey his work because it's, it's so rich in texture. There's, I, think it's, I think there's 55 different layers of color on here. Uh, Francis is meeting the eye of the wolf there. As he sits there in the forest praying, his gaze meets the gaze of the wolf. Uh, there's only one place where a bright scarlet red is used in this image, and it's in the gums of the wolf. So it's nature, red in tooth and claw. So Francis is sitting there with the wolf at his feet. The wolf is frightening looking, or as frightening as John August Swanson can make a wolf look. He's not a man who's goes in for a lot of darkness. Uh, there is that gaze between Francis and the predator. It's a serene gaze. In his reconciliation with Christ, in his faith, in his humility, in some ways, and we know this from many traditions, right, that many claim this, right, in some ways the alienation between humankind and creation is undone. In this portrayal, right, Francis sitting there with the wolf, as you said, paradise is recreated around him. Through his forthright, humble engagement with the predator, his humble, literally humiliated, uh, sitting on the humus of the earth, right, barefoot, in that, paradise is regained in this image. This is just the image that I felt comfortable sharing because it's got the copyright John August Swanson on it. You can find more detailed images on, online. I encourage you to see them. Uh, just the richness and the depth of this is, is really an amazing and profound thing. And around it are, is told the life of Francis on the top and below his conversion. And then the canticle of Brother, Son, and Sister Moon is told in the images down the side. It's lovely. So in that gaze between Francis and the wolf, his disarmed gaze his vulnerable gaze, right, looking into the eye of the wolf. Uh, the story was that this was a very large wolf that was uh, threatening the people of Gubbio. Uh, they sent out knights to fight it, and the wolf would eat the knights up. Uh, Francis came along and said, I can help. Right? And so he goes out into the woods, dressed like Francis does, which is in rags with no shoes on. Uh, and he sees the wolf, and he says, he greets the wolf. He says, Brother Wolf. And he makes the sign of the cross, and the wolf bows to him. And he has a conversation with the wolf, and he brings the wolf back into town and says, you need to take care of your brother wolf. You need to feed him. He's hungry. Take care of him, and he's agreed that he'll be in peace with you. This is a lovely Catholic fairy tale. Uh, the odd, decidedly odd thing I don't really know what to do with, in the 19th century, they were excavating the chapel in Gubbio, and they dug up a very large canine 
um, skeleton that was buried in the church graveyard. So it's not a fairy tale. Francis makes much of the gaze of St. Francis. In the story, Francis was the only one who could look the wolf in the eye as a brother. Everyone else saw it as this horrific uh, threat to them. Uh, Barry Lopez, in his wonderful book of Wolves and Men, which I commend to all of you, um, he goes through this story and he says, he notes that it was probably a wolf hybrid because uh, it was very large and it was not afraid of human beings. Uh, actual you know, purebred wolves don't want to have anything to do with us and they're not quite as big as this one was. So when you breed wolves and dogs, you get things that aren't afraid of you and they're very large. Uh, so Francis is the one who engages the wolf. He can treat it as brother. And so that gives meaning to this passage from Lozado C. again. Francis helps us to see that an integral ecology calls for openness to categories which transcend the language of mathematics and biology and take us to the heart of what it is to be human. Justice happens when we fall in love with someone. Whenever he would gaze at the sun, the moon, or the smallest of creatures, he would burst into song, drawing all other creatures into his praise. He communed with all creation, even preaching to the flowers, inviting them to praise the Lord, just as if they were endowed with reason, quoting Bonaventure there. I want to move on to this as a principle of conversion and convey the gaze as a way of converting rather than the will, right? Being told that you should do this, that this matters, you should care, and then deciding that I will care, right? I will give up meat. I will bike to school. I will sacrifice this. I will sacrifice that, right? Because I know it's the right thing to do. This is a different path of conversion that comes by the gaze. He says, such a conviction cannot be written off as naive romanticism, for it affects the choices which determine our behavior. If we approach nature and the environment without this openness to awe and wonder, if we no longer speak the language of fraternity and beauty, in our relationships to the world, our attitudes will be that of masters, consumers, ruthless exploiters, unable to set limits on their immediate needs. But, by contrast, if we feel intimately united with all that exists, then sobriety and care will well up spontaneously. The poverty and austerity of St. Francis were no mere veneer of asceticism, but something much more radical, a refusal to turn reality into an object simply to be used and controlled. I experienced this in my own life. Uh, 13 years ago, I moved into a house up in Dayton, um, and on the hill, uh, I noticed in the springtime that there is a certain kind of bee that lives there. Uh, and I had small children at the time, and I was worried about them getting stung. And they were always flying around the sidewalk. Uh, second year, I noticed them, and I noticed that they didn't look like other bees. So what are these things? And so through the glories of the Internet, I could search little sort of gray and white bees that live in the ground. Uh, I found out these were minor bees. Uh, and they live in the hillside. Uh, they don't. They're not like... Um, they're not monastic bees. They're not like Benedictines. They don't live in a big hive together. Uh, if you know the history of spirituality, they're more like Beguines. Uh, they have little houses side by side. Each one has a tunnel. Um, they dig that tunnel. They live in the bottom. They come out. Uh, they come out uh, right at the end of April. And they have to find um, pollen, enough pollen to make a ball of pollen and put it at the bottom of their tunnel, lay their eggs on it so that the next generation can, can eat that uh, turn in, you know, as larva, pupate, and then be ready next spring to come out again. Um, so I began with these bees just worried about them stinging my children's soft little five-year-old legs, right? And I was like, you know, be careful. What are these bees doing? Uh, the more I learned about them, the more I care about them. And now every April, I worry quite a bit, right? Did, did, did it get warm too soon? Are they going to come out and when they will not be able to get pollen? Uh, did, that, did it work last year? Did they make it through the winter? Right? And so none of this was someone coming to me and saying, you should care about the bees. Right? It was simply paying attention to them. And my first response to them was not, oh, wonderful, a bee. Let me know about the bee. Right? But it gradually, just by opening my eyes to them, 
I have, I care about them very much, right? Uh, and I think it's lovely that the uh, eastern facing hill at the bottom of my yard has a whole big enage of bees that lives there. Uh, my point there, again, is not my own virtue, right? Is just by noticing something and pulling on that thread and attending to it, the relationships become real, right? I now share, I now live in a home with these minor bees. They, you know, we are neighbors, and I, I do care about them quite a bit. So Francis is saying here that an attentive gaze can be transformational. Uh, so I want to end by talking about where to look. And this is a very poorly constructed uh, slide. I'm sorry, I'm not very good at PowerPoint at all. Um, there are limits on our gaze. The two limits we have are sinful disregard and the limits of human perception. And we tend to, in religious circles, to talk about sinful disregard first. And Francis in the encyclical tends to talk about that, right? So we're selfish, self-concerned consumers, we're exploiters, right? And that's the way we view the world. I don't think most of us are that way. Um, I really learned the lesson when I went to work in this forest. Um, I was working with a scientist to understand all the connections in the Pacific Northwest forest. Uh, so all the species that live in a single tree, all the connections of the roots and the mycorrhizal networks underground, right? And so this is all lovely. I'm walking through this, and it's a beautiful, old-growth Douglas fir forest. But it occurs to me that I don't see any of that stuff. The only way I know these things is because I'm hanging out with these scientists here who have spent the past 40 years trying to understand that stuff, right? I can go in there and be the most sincere, attentive, Laudato Si' reading Catholic theologian in the world, right? And I can't see those mycorrhizal networks. I can't see the endophytic uh, um, algae that lives in the needles, right? I, I, I don't know those relationships. I don't understand what the... There's this uh, stuff that looks like dragon skin. It's a kind of... Um, uh, oh, bad point. Plan, plan words. It's a kind of lichen that lives in the trees. It looks very much like white and green dragon skin. On one side, it looks like Napa cabbage. On the other side, it looks like the skin of a white dragon. Um, and it's all over the place. Uh, turns out that's what fixes nitrogen for a mature forest because there's no sunlight for any kind of ground plant that could fix, fix nitrogen for the forest. And so there's tons and tons of this stuff raining down all the time. Um, I don't know that. They didn't know that. It took enormous amounts of work to find that out. Uh, first, they had to test the stuff. And one guy said, you know, why is all this here? What's it doing? He ran chemical tests on it and found out that, in fact, it's fixing nitrogen. Then they had to try to figure out, was there enough of it to matter? And it's up 230 feet in the air. So they said, so they tried cutting down a tree. When you cut down a tree the, to study the crown, you just get a bunch of mush at the end, right? So that didn't work. And one day, the professor was sitting in his office, and a female master's student walked in and said, I can get up there if you need me to. And he said, what do you mean? She said, I'm a, I'm a rock climber. I can climb that tree. This was 1978, back when women leading scientific expeditions in trees was not generally approved. And he said, well, don't tell anyone. Um, so she climbed the tree. They, they went out, and they measured how much was out on the branches. Uh, and they calculated how much there was in, a, in an acre, and they found out that, yes, that's exactly where the nitrogen comes from that lets these forests live longer than 100 years, right? Because it sucks up all the nitrogen from the ground plants in the first 100 years, then there's no more ground plants. It's all in shade. How does it grow for 500 years? Well, it turns out this stuff shows up at about 100 years. It's all that work in the lab. It's all that work of that, that young woman climbing in that tree and measuring that stuff up there to know what's going on, right? So I'm very sincere, but I can't see any of that. Right. I don't go there as an exploiter. So there are two limits to our gaze. And one is just the, our, our, sorry, I was pushing that button while I was talking, wasn't I? Um, that we can't see all the complexities of creation around us with our, with our natural senses. Um, so science helps us that way. And so books that probably a lot of you know, uh, Susan Smart is the person who discovered and did the primary research to prove that trees were actually sharing resources through mycorrhizal networks. Uh, and her book about her life and her discoveries, Finding the Mother Tree is Out, her TED Talk, The World Wide, The Wood Wide Web, which makes me kind of cringe, uh, but it has 9 million views last time I checked. It's right for 12 million now. Um, 
explaining that research is really worth finding on the internet. She's an amazing person who, you know, really against profound odds and enormous bias, was able to really prove chemically that this was happening. Uh, the article that I wrote out of visiting that forest, you can find on Commonweal, a cathedral not made by hands. I don't really like that title either. It makes me cringe as well, but Commonweal picked it for me. So they didn't even ask. I just came in the mail. It's like, oh, that's the title of the article, huh? Um, but the real point of it is reading La Dada Sea in an old growth forest, which they didn't think was a good title. Um, Peter Woolaben's Hidden Life of Trees is beautiful. Uh, not entirely scientific, but there's a lot of science in it, uh, and it's a wonderful read as well. Uh, many of you are doing this, but this is one of the ways that we can live out Laudato Si, is by immersing ourselves in the rest of creation around us, not just in state parks and national forests, right, but what's right there? The sparrows that are right there, the, the bees that are coming up from the grass right there, the ants that are right there. We are all connected, and there's a value in being a sibling to them. Uh, Pain is a big part of this and a fundamental thing that many of us encounter as we try to deal with climate change. There's so much destruction. I quoted that part from Francis before. Our goal is not to amass information to satisfy curiosity, but rather to become painfully aware. And we live in an era where to become aware is to become painfully aware. Um, that forest that I wrote in five years ago in 2020, on Labor Day, there was a massive wind event. Uh, dry wind out of the east, uh, blowing downslope at hurricane force after an unseasonably dry summer, and it blew over a power line right next to that forest, right next to that ancient grove. That ancient grove is not going to last forever. Everything's finite. I did not think it would go away in two years. The fire roared down the valley, destroyed an entire town, leveled thousands of acres, wiped out. It looks like a moonscape there. Um, one of the happy facts is that an old growth forest is much more robust than many of those stands of commercial stands that were all the same height and age and didn't have all the fungus and moss underneath. Uh, so the old growth forest, you can walk into it and there's 30 foot black marks on the trees, but the forest is still there. But to love something is to open yourself to that pain, right? For me to love those bees is every spring to worry that they don't come. Uh, reading the news as painful awareness is a spiritual exercise, and the news will provide you with ample material to do that on any given day. Uh, right now, you know, I, I find this something that's utterly overwhelming is Pakistan. You know, as I said earlier, we're not responding to Pakistan on any, even remotely the scale that they need, right? We're giving hundreds of millions of dollars to 33 million people who are homeless and need to eat, and they're gonna need to eat for the entire year, right? This is hard to watch. And we can give things, and that's a good thing, we can volunteer things, right? I can't feed 33 million people myself, no matter how much I give. Um, I can push the government to do that, right? But to keep our eyes open, um, as horrific as this may be, to try to do something. Um, there's a whole spiritual experience of painful awareness there. Um, and may we, as humankind, respond in some way adequate. Uh, we have not yet. It is not promising. Uh, Emergence Magazine, if you don't know that, is a new environmental spirituality magazine. It's, it's, it's mostly online. They, they do have published copies. Um, and they often have... Uh, really profound spiritual reflections on contemporary ecological issues and contemporary ecological grief. Uh, and I wrote an article after those wildfires to follow up on the first one, uh, and I offer that to you as well as a meditation on grief and, and seeing. So that's what I wanted to say tonight. I leave you with three questions for the breakout pods. Um, you have them in your folders, but they're also on the screen. Uh, so thank you very much for your time, and we'll reconvene. Thanks.
Thank you, Dr. Miller. Gave us a lot to think about. So now we're going to spend some time processing what we heard, reflecting together in small groups. If you're in the chapel, you should have received a copy of the reflection questions as you entered. If you're watching on the live stream, now is the time to join the Zoom room with Sissy Air. The link was emailed to you and is also available in the YouTube video description. We're going to spend the next 20 minutes or so discussing in groups of three or four. We invite you, if you're comfortable, to form a group with those that you don't know. Please introduce yourselves and share a few general impressions, what speaks to you, what challenges you from the presentation, and then go ahead and move into those reflection questions. When we have about one minute left, I'll give us the warning to come back for some final sharing and Q&A.
We're going to take about one more minute, and then we're going to come back to the large group. One minute warning. If you want to wrap up your final thoughts and make your way back to your seats, we're going to end with some Q&A. All right, well, welcome back, everyone. Hopefully, you all had good conversations. We've got about 15 minutes left. Um, we're going to open it up. If you want to raise your hand, I'll come around with the microphone so that everyone on live stream can hear us. Feel free to give any sharings that you wanted to share with the group or if you have questions for Dr. Miller. Okay, my name is Gabby, and I wanted to know your perspective. So, like, can you connect human innate curiosity to mm. your your theory of attentiveness? Huh. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I yeah, I, I think I think wonder is a fundamental part of being human, right? In, in the, in the the joy we take in, in, in discovering new things and, and attending them and knowing what they are. Um, I, I, yeah, um, I, there's a student back at the University of Dayton who's writing a dissertation on wonder as, as, a, as a passion and as a virtue. Um, uh, E.O. Wilson talked about uh, biophilia. He, he, he thought that evolution gave us this, this innate interest in life systems. Um, which is kind of a scientific way of saying that, but I think wonder really captures that, right? You know, we, I think we, we feel fully alive uh, when we're when we're engaging the world and, and, and trying to understand it. Those seem to be really privileged moments. Does that does that yeah. speak to your experience? Thank you. Yeah. 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 I'm coming. I'm coming. <laughs> And um, people were just really taken with this idea of gazing mm -hmm. and just really appreciated the ability to go from the head to the heart, mm -hmm. which is what you did for us with mm -hmm. the artwork you brought in and with your story. They mm -hmm. sp specifically, you know, we're talking about the bee story. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much. I know we all appreciated it. Oh, 
yeah, I'm glad that conveyed. The B story was utterly unplanned. I, I needed, it just occurred to me when I saw you, so. Um, but as an example of being drawn out, right? Um, yeah. Hello, my name is Raven Crawford. And all the guys in our group are of a certain age. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so we bring the perspective of elders to this question. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to let you know that I'm an Eastern Christian. Mm. So, of course, the spirituality of gays oh, is yeah, absolutely yeah. fundamental. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that people picked up that it can be cultivated, mm -hmm. you can learn things in it, mm -hmm. and it leads to a predisposition mm -hmm. toward interaction. So it mm -hmm. is fundamentally transforming. Mm -hmm. What we found really transforming was your passion about those bees. Mm, 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 mm. And that was the most riveting part of the presentation mm. because you showed us your own heart. Ah, oh, indeed. Yeah, so. Which leads me mm -hmm. to a painful awareness mm. that the other side of gazing is witnessing. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's a great way to say it, yeah. So that, you know, at my age and with my fragility, mm. that's about the only gift I have left, hmm. and it's daunting. Hmm. I don't know how you have the courage to be so vulnerable. Hmm. Hmm. Next. <coughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, I'm a very shy person. You, with, even with the volume of the microphone, I'm not entirely comfortable hearing myself. Um, but I do find in, in terms of wonder and being drawn out of yourself, um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's a joy of those, that solves the problem. Um, <laughs> in engaging the world, right? Um, uh, you know, witness is, is, is not simply about speaking our own truth, but about sharing how the world has, has changed us and how the, you know, how the world has drawn us into itself. And I think that, you know, I think courage is more easily, at least for me, courage is more easily found there, right? I can tell you the story of that forest. I can tell you the story of those bees. Um, I, you know, I can tell you the story of a river. Um, and I might tell you, I, I may tell you many very personal things about myself along the way, but, but in sharing those things, I think, you know, courage comes much more easily, at least in my experience. Thank you for your talk. Um, you opened your talk with a, like a litany of things that we might become painfully aware of. Yeah, yeah. Um, how would you suggest or what would you tell this audience? Um, how can we maintain a disposition of hope um, and not slip into despair Yeah. Um, in that? That is the question. Um, uh, there's a lot to be said on that. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about that since that, since that Labor Day fire. Um, uh, so two attempts to answer that from the, from the Catholic tradition resources that I find. Uh, one is this massive change in piety that Western civilization lives on the other side of. Uh, in, in the 1500s and 1600s, the emergence of uh, a, a Marian emotional piety, right? And so this, these are all just sort of standard tropes for us, right? Mary at the foot of the cross looking distraught, right? Her gaze taking in Jesus' suffering and her visage, her emotional visage conveying that suffering to us. Uh, that, that's, that happened in time, right? If you go back before 1500, that's, that's not there. Um, uh, and we live, you know, modern Western civilization, the kind of emotional repertoire we have is, lives on the side of that. Um, what I find in that is um, uh, there is the lesson that horrific suffering can be countenanced, right? Mary doesn't look away. You know, she's overwhelmed, and I mean, much, much as art portrays her as overwhelmed, but she just doesn't look away. Um, and so that's that's the heart of the, of of the, of the Western Christian traditions, um, and, and I think of, of Western European culture. Um, uh, we know that. Uh, 
and, and there, there's strength there, right? It, it, so that, you know, part of how Catholicism works is, is in the ability to, uh, to witness, to, uh, to take in Christ's unmerited, innocent suffering. Um, so there's a resource there. Um, hope, I've, I've really been uh, in, influenced over the past several months by um, a contemporary Carmelite sister, Constance Fitzgerald, um, and she applies the notion of the dark night of the soul to social questions, and she speaks of impasse. Um, and I, I, I find dark night spirituality and love to be a way of talking about this that, that, that resonates with people. Um, you know, the dark night of the soul is uh, when faith in God becomes dark and is no longer gratifying in any way, right? Prayer becomes empty and dry and, and feels pointless. And it feels like you don't believe. It feels like God isn't real. Um, and John of the Cross and um, Teresa of Avila, you know, both saw in that, that, as horrific as that experience is, it's really actually a deeper kind of faith, right? Um, you know, prayer isn't about warm fuzzies, and God isn't the big teddy bear that's always there for you in the sky. God's something much more mysterious than we can understand. And so when all that falls away, uh, there's a new kind of dark faith that emerges, right? So faith doesn't die, it gets deeper. And, you know, we, you know, depending on our spiritualities and where we are in, in, in that walk, um, you know, we may, we may experience love for God, and in the dark night, right, you know, God seems to go away as, 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 as a presence that we can love, right? And so, again, for John of the Cross, love doesn't go away, right? Love becomes this dark love, right? Uh, it's, it's a pure love that doesn't depend upon any kind of recompense. Uh, and finally, right, so faith, hope, and love, the three theological virtues, you know, hope goes away as well, right? Uh, that, that the spiritual life is going somewhere. Um, you know, these are Carmelites who've devoted their lives to this, and none of it's working anymore, right? They're contemplatives. This is, this is what they do with their day, right? And none of it works anymore. And embracing the dark night as, 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 a, as a difficult but positive development in the spiritual life is that hope doesn't depend upon any recompense, any, any sense of light, right? Hope is continuing to love in the dark. Uh, so I find those two aspects of a Christian response to be very, very helpful. Um, I, was, I was back in Oregon this summer and working with, with a group that um, had spent years coming up with grants to restore a, a salmon habitat. Uh, millions of dollars. They finally got all the grants and massive machines came in and recarved side channels for the river, and they made all these places where salmon could spawn. And salmon is a, is a salmon spawning river. It's the Mackenzie River. It's a tributary to the, to the Willamette. And so finally, you know, years of work and all these volunteers and all this time has gone into this, and it's time for the salmon spawn, which is in two days. Uh, it's on the 17th every year. Um, and last year where there was the heat dome in the Pacific Northwest, and the Willamette was too hot. You know, it's like, you know, salmon are running marathons in a 95 degree day. They, it doesn't work, right? And most of them died before they got down the Mackenzie. It's 100 miles down the Willamette to the Mackenzie. And it was one of the lowest spawns they ever had. Uh, now, it's not the end of the story because it's a multi-year life cycle, and this year the river's cooler, and hopefully the spawn will be there. Salmon came to spawn. Um, but when I was there doing this work on Dark Hope, um, and they said, you know, can you tell us what you're doing, right? And I'm like, well, I'm a Catholic theologian, you know, I don't know if, if you're into this stuff. Um, and so I told them that, and I said, you know, I said, it's, it's like what you do, right? You, you, you love those salmon regardless, right? You want them to come, you want them to thrive, but the love doesn't go away, you know? And the care for the salmon does not go away, even if it doesn't work. And it's, you know, they don't give up. They don't just say, well, we, we still love them even though they're not here. They're, they're, they're trying to do everything they can to help them. Um, but that hope and love uh, is real in the face of that actual pain of loss. The pain tells you that you're 
engaged with the world. Um, and so when I talked about dark hope, they, the, you know, these were, this was uh, a bunch of college-age student volunteers in the Pacific Northwest, and I did not think, I was a little nervous, right, because I, I don't know, I'm, I'm a shy theologian. Um, but they were all staring right at me, right? They got that, and that really seemed to, to work for them. And I think that's, this is, this is where we are in history, right? You know, we're, 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 gonna, we're loving a world that we've destroyed and trying to heal it. And there's going to be unimaginable pain in that. Um, uh, and the kind of faith, hope, and love that humankind is going to need is going to be a dark one, right? Because we can save things. It's not too late. Everything is not lost. Uh, but a lot is deeply broken. Um, and a lot has been destroyed. Uh, and so to become the carers for the world that we were made to be, to become the gardeners we were, were created to be, right, is to face the wounds. Um, and so I think all of that is something that Catholicism really has to offer a lot of resources in. And I, I, I suspect all of you, most of you know that in some place, right, that this, this, this applies. We know this already, right? Um, We've got time for one more quick question or comment. Uh, I was really inspired this year by Jane Goodall's book, The Book of Hope. Mm. Oh, neat. Um, she, the man that interviewed her for the book came up with all of these atrocious stories about water, air, pollution, fires, floods. And for every situation, she would be able to point out some little group that was doing something or some courageous champions in this part of the world or I mean it's just an incredible book of her journey and her hope for humanity despite all this trouble that we're seeing I was I think it's a just a wonderful book the book of hope the book of hope I didn't know that I, I will certainly look for that yeah Thank you. There, there's a novel about climate change that came out two years ago it's called the ministry for the future by a contemporary science fiction author named Kim Stanley Robinson. He's a hard science fiction writer. He does scenarios that are realistic. Um, and basically, it takes you from 2025 with the rather horrific opening scene to 2075 with CO2 levels coming down and humankind having faced that challenge. Um, there's a chapter in the end that is absolutely luminescent. He's, 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 not a, he's not a literary writer by any means, right? A, it's, it's a UN meeting of um, uh, restorative agriculture and watershed carers and, and, and ecological carers from around the world. And it's nothing but four pages of, of introductions, right? You know, we are from this part of Uganda, we care for this river, you know, and people to introducing themselves, right? And the last line is, you know, come join us in this great work. Um, what he doesn't say anywhere in the novel is it's four pages of groups that actually exist. Right? This isn't fiction. Every single one is doing what they say in there. Uh, so it's, it's a beautiful, hopeful movement right? that people are doing, as, as you quoted from Goodall there, right? there. There are people all around the world doing this stuff. There are people right here in Cincinnati. Some of you are doing these things. Um, there's, there's hope in that. Uh, so. Thank you so much. If you all join me one more time in thanking Dr. Miller. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller, for helping us kick off our Embracing God's Creation series. So tonight's presentation will follow up with an immersion on Saturday, September 24th at 1 p.m. to explore the ecological initiatives at St. Xavier High School. The tour will be student-led by their Environmental Action Club and their advisor, Meg Shaughnessy. You can RSVP on the same form you used to RSVP for tonight's lecture. There will also be two more presentations this fall. The next one will be here in the chapel on October 3rd at 7 p.m. when we'll be hosting a panel presentation on the spirituality of agriculture. Be sure to RSVP online um, and you'll receive information on future events from that RSVP as well. And lastly, if you did not complete our pre-assessment yet, please do so soon. 
There's a QR code on your reflection sheet that directly links you to that assessment, and it should have been emailed to everyone who RSVP'd as well. Thank you all again for joining us this evening. A recording of this will be available on Bellarmine's YouTube channel. Please feel free to share that link with anyone you may know who would be interested. And for those of you who are here in the chapel with us tonight, we do have some cookies and lemonade out in the back. So if you would like to join us. And we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you and have a great night. <laughs>